Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you please tell me once again your name? I'm Anna Lisa. It's nice to meet you. I'm Rick. Nice to meet you. Uh, this is Dimitri. Hello, Standing Dimitri. Together with us. We all know Dimitri, guys. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe Dimitri, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please tell us about yourself? Because Peter Duke there told me that you have a startup, you have a fund. Can you please tell us about this? I'm excited to know. Yeah, like uh, some of it is true. So I do have a startup. I don't have a fund. Uh -huh. uh, Sorry, that I yeah. maybe mixed it in my mind. No worries. <laughs> I mean, like most Estonians, I run a startup. Um, and uh, we are making packaging, sustainable packaging from wool. And how I got here is that when the full-scale war started, we started making some mattresses. So we had like leftover wool and we used this to make mattresses for the guys on the front line. And then last November I came here with the convoy for the first time and saw everything that was happening and it was just very, I don't even know what to say, like very moving. And um, then I decided to try my own like fundraising campaign for the Medevex and now this this is the third one uh, nice. we're bringing, and then the fourth one probably next month. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's, that's a very good result. Okay, can you show us those medevacs? Yeah, let's go. It's let's over go there. So, hey, well, I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, so this is the medevac, uh, yeah. and it has some equipment in the back, right? Yeah, you want to see it? Yeah, of course. Let's, let's go. go. Because I think uh, not all of my viewers know about them. Yeah, so the last campaign that we did, we uh, basically summoned the power of Estonian startups. So we had like a charity run and then uh, all the uh, startups that were participating, they donated into the campaign. So you can see here like a skyline of uh, Tallinn and Kiev. So we mm -hmm. call it from Estonian unicorns to Ukrainian heroes. Nice. Estonian and unicorns to Ukrainian heroes. Yes. Here you have the Medivac. Mm -hmm. So we have a, um, what is it sled, called? I a think. sled, yeah, for the wounded soldiers. And then you see there's like a control panel there. So you have different types of lights. You have the red mm -hmm. light for uh, seeing blood. You have the, um, the white lights and then a blue light for nighttime. Mm -hmm. And then some chairs here for the medics and some uh, storage for all the medical equipment and, and some tires. and. Of course, some chocolates from Estonia, yeah, which is also, also very important. Have, uh, uh, remotely heating system. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. So it can be warm here. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, connected to the heating system of uh, the uh, truck. It's, it's you. You turn on the remotely uh -huh. heater. You see. You see the heater. You can put the so like uh, warming here to. The, you know, for mm -hmm. the wounded people, it's very important. Nice. I mean, how I, I was just wondering how the heater works. Is it connected to the heating system of the no, car? No, it's auto. Out, it's a uh, uh, so you also need to put fuel in it. Yeah, it's a diesel one. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's yeah. a diesel one, and uh, just curious, where do you put the diesel into the heater uh, <laughs> for the heater? We need to ask the the mechanic. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. where they put, but you can regulate it over there. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And there's one really cool thing. I mean, cool is probably not the right word, but for the winter time. So this part here, uh, you can put like IV solutions here. So things that would usually freeze, like medical, um, like liquids that would freeze. Mm -hmm. They need controlled temperature. So you can put it here and the heating system, it heats it up really fast. So usually before that, they would have to put it on the front uh, like glass to heat uh, frozen things up, but now they can put it here. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of this medevac? 20,000 euros. So you raised for two or three of them in this campaign? Um, so in this campaign we reached 60,000. Yeah, That's we're at like 59 right now, but I mean it's gonna happen. So yeah, yeah. three medevacs from this campaign. That's amazing. Uh, I'm, we're together with Lila doing a campaign right now for the regular truck. Uh, and uh, yeah guys I remind you that you can actually donate to that because it's a bit stuck uh, this time it's going slower than the previous one but anyway uh, it we will get there uh, I'm will. gonna work on it also <laughs> so um, also want to ask you more about yourself if Dimitri uh, needs to go he can go but <laughs> because it can go for 10 more minutes and I know that you're busy <laughs> but um, and I really want to know your background leave you. yeah okay. thanks man yeah. uh, what do you do uh, and what also you were doing before the full-scale invasion uh, can you please tell us about yourself because I, r I really always know uh, like to know people when I meet them here 
uh, because here I think the best people are gathering, people who care, who really um, see that they can make a difference. And yeah. yeah. There's yeah, so I'm like a, a typical Estonian in the sense that I run a startup um, and we founded it in 2020 uh, and we are making sustainable packaging. So once we started the company, there was one problem that I just couldn't live with and it's climate change because mm -hmm. I saw that, you know, this has the potential of like ruining everyone's life and it's a big yep. threat to humans because usually when people talk about climate change, they think that it's a threat for the nature and animals. But at the end of the day, like we're protecting humans from flaws, forest fires and like disastrous events. And so, uh, yeah, we were running it since 2020. And then in uh, uh, 2022, when the full scale war started, we felt like, um, you know, the first week for us, we were safe. We didn't have the same worries that the Ukrainian people had, but I felt like a complete lack of motivation or like an identity crisis. Like, what's the point of running a company? What's the point of like trying to make profit if like a few countries away, there's people who are being killed, yeah. just civilians. And so there, it was very hard to find like motivation to keep going. And so we started like slow with helping Ukraine with making mattresses from production uh, waste that we had. And it, it was maybe in a way selfish because it kind of gave us back some purpose that we know that we're not just like, you know, standing by and not helping people. Mm -hmm. We're doing like whatever we could at that point. And now that two years have, have passed uh, and, you know, I'm doing these fundraising campaigns mainly from my free time and uh, I feel like uh, that's something that I need to do in order to be able to focus on my regular work as well because it's the same thing like climate change and helping Ukraine it's just fighting injustice because what Russia is doing is massive injustice mm -hmm. so it is uh, that's why we're doing this you see Russia is also committing ecocide here in Ukraine Absolutely. and I think what is going on here uh, due to the military action it affects the climate change uh, also it, it so much it speeds it up so by helping ukraine you're actually helping to fight the climate change that's true but it's also like it's kind of a paradox because it is definitely like an eco disaster that the war brings but we can't focus on it right away because we cannot fix climate change if uh, we haven't fixed the war, right? No. The same reason why, like, uh, in Estonia, people working with climate change are helping Ukraine right now because we know that if uh, we would be in this position, we wouldn't be working uh, on our startups because we would be fighting for freedom, right? So climate change is, like, what I guess in Ukraine right now it comes second, of course, because you have to fight for your freedom. Yeah, and for our existence, actually, because Russians, you know, that they are committing genocide. You know this perfectly well because you guys were occupied by uh, Soviets, Russians. Yeah. You know that. And you... Oh, my hand is falling off. Yeah, I need to go this way <laughs> to, to switch hand. And you can relate and you know that uh, you're a danger because you have the border. You also share border with Russia. Yeah. And um, do you... That, that's why you guys help us so much, I think, because you can re to totally relate to that. So in, uh, in so many ways, actually, because uh, when Estonia was occupied by the Soviet Union, we had this um, in the early years, and of course I was not alive then, but I know this information from generation to generation that the Estonians back then we were independent and then occupied mm -hmm. and then people kept thinking that the West will come and help us there's no way that they're gonna like just watch this happen and stand by and that's exactly what happened and this is like a topic in the Estonian society that's like a, it really hits a note so I feel like that's why Estonians are helping so much because we know what it's like to be like left behind mm -hmm. by the West and um, yeah, the border thing as well. So uh, I grew up in south of Estonia and my home is 300 meters from the Russian border. Oh, shit. Like I see it from my window. So uh, yeah, I know why I'm helping. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sending you hugs for, um, I don't know, when you start saying uh, we've, we, have, we know the feeling by uh, be, being abandoned by the West, uh, at that point, I wanted to hug you because I know that uh, I am from Donetsk, Makivka, um, and I know how it is to be abandoned by the West since 2014. Yeah. 
uh, it was uh, really when 2022nd full scale invasion started I um, I had that experience of 2014 and I uh, thought that it's gonna be just the same again but then in a month or two I was convinced uh, that no it, it's gonna be different this time and uh, I finally started doing something too yeah uh, taking action and this is this is good and this is good to have the rewritten experience you know yeah when you when you see that uh, it can be different when you see that um, West can even change somehow so yeah but they need to do so much more uh, countries in uh, Western Europe they don't uh, they don't know what it's like to fight yeah. Russia and that Russia will never stop uh, and also I feel like there's a I, I even feel it with my friends in Western Europe that they don't grasp the seriousness of the mm -hmm. situation. So we need to keep working on this sort of lobby as well. And we need these people to come to the convoy, to come to Kiev and see for their for themselves that they need to like start acting and not just, you know, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, send in prayers to you guys. <laughs> a lot of people are coming here to Ukraine and uh, leading by example. And a lot more will come. And guys, you should not wait until the end of the war. You need to come now because this war might last for years and decades, unfortunately. And we have a strong enemy. We laugh at them, but at the same time, we should not underestimate them because they are very strong. And right now they having a, a success. Uh, last year, the end of the last year and the beginning of this year, they were, mm, yeah, due to the lack of the Western support that was promised, but um, weren't br brought to us yeah. for half a year. They had a ma major success there on the front line and still advancing. They still are not stopped. And it's so hard to see um, town after town, village after village being fully destroyed. And it feels like by the end of the, I don't know, 2025, every the remaining town and village in uh, Donetsk Oblast will be destroyed. Mm, it's really, really uh, sad and uh, also outrageous to see that and to know that uh, it could be prevented, actually, if, yeah. uh, if more leaders uh, had more balls, you know? <laughs> yeah. You agree we just with me, I guess. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I have a message or two, or two to uh, Germany, for example. <laughs> but uh, you know, um, there are things that are not under my control. I cannot go to the uh, slide to the DMs of like you know chancellors and stuff. Yeah. But what we can do is uh, lead by example, at least as civilians. And yeah. I I hope that uh, at least Estonian like government is uh, showing example. But of course, we're such a small country and. Um, Western Europeans don't often take us that seriously. So what we can do is just um, this, continue this, and show people that uh, even as a civilian, you can definitely make a difference. I, would, I will tell you that uh, being an active members of society and actually um, like bringing more members to the active part of society is already uh, given some change and we can devel develop our countries by that and we're doing that and mm -hmm. I think we someday will become those big European countries who um, will be um, dictating to those former big European yeah. countries you know <laughs> that's an ambitious plan I have here I mean it's <laughs> realistic like in terms of security at least we we know a thing or two about that yeah you're right um, I don't actually know what else to ask you but I think it's all been said <laughs> it's all been said I just want to thank you for doing what you do oh the mattresses I wanted to ask uh, so you're giving them to Ukrainian soldiers civilians both uh, to whom are you uh, giving sorry those? one second I will just see where the handover is at okay they're not here yet they're not here uh, yet. yeah so because to, you're given one of the trucks. yeah and I, I just wanted to hear the stories Oh, got yeah, it. So okay. I'm taking you too long, but we're finishing no, up. We'll, Just we'll finish with tell this. us a yeah. bit uh, so about mattresses. So mattresses, it's it's uh, for the soldiers at the front line. So it all started when I saw a picture on Twitter of a Ukrainian soldier back in 2022 sleeping in the trenches mm -hmm. in one of those like old, like muddy 
I wouldn't even call it a mattress. And we had uh, production leftover wool, and wool is a very good insulator, so it keeps you warm. And then we had like weatherproof covers for it, so it's it sounds like a small thing, but we thought that at least we can make like one moment of one soldier's day easier. That you know, after like a I, w I can't even say like a hard day because it's harder than anyone can imagine. No. At least you have like a comfortable mattress to it's sleep in. It's actually not a small thing at all. It's a big thing when you have such terrible harsh conditions as on the front line. Having a good uh, place to sleep is actually a big thing. So you're doing a big thing. It's not a small thing. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Can you please show us one of them if they're here? We don't have them here. We only have... Uh, yeah, we send them in the winter. So last winter we sent, I think, 200. And this winter maybe 300, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I've seen them in the previous nice, uh, handover yeah. <laughs> events. Uh, that, that's yeah. what I... Yeah, I was wondering. Now yeah. I know it's, it's you who yeah. made them. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, it's very nice to meet you, Me and uh, I'll let you go and listen to yeah. the stories of the soldiers, uh, because that's that's the most important thing. It really is. And most important voices uh, are their voices. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, and see you soon. <laughs>